Hello, everyone, and welcome to our November 2022 Virtual Vendor Summit. Um, I know we're meeting virtual again this time. I am hopeful that our next meeting will, will be in person. I know several of us, including myself, were fortunate enough to be at Vienna um, for an in-person developer summit back in early September, and that went really well. So I'm looking forward to doing more of these things in person and getting to see folks face-to-face. -face. But for today, uh, we're online on Zoom, as you can see. Uh, and let's see what else I want to go over. Um, so uh, this vendor summit is pretty similar to the developer summit we, went, we ran last June um, with a similar schedule. So we'll have kind of about 30 minute breaks between talks. And during those breaks, you can head over to the hallway track, which is on spatial chat. <clears throat> We've dropped a link to the spatial chat room. It was in the email you received if you're attending. Um, we've also posted it in IRC and the Dev Summit channel on FNet. Um, speaking of IRC, if you want to um, kind of, aside from talking in the hallway track, if you want to kind of chat with folks during the conference, you can meet on IRC in the Dev Summit channel on FNet Network. Um, there's also a Dev Summit on uh, FreeBSD Slack instance that you can also talk to folks in. Those are also places that you can ask questions of speakers. We do ask that if you ask a question, of a speaker on IRC or Slack that you please put a capital Q colon prefix in front of it so that we can recognize it and help relay them to the speakers. If you're attending the summit on Zoom, you can also use the Q Zoom's Q&A feature from, for Zoom webinar to ask questions of speakers during their talks. Um, just as our last past several virtual summits that we've had, um, the foundation has sponsored this. They cover the cost of doing the webinar um, and also, uh, several folks from the foundation help with actual managing the organization, inviting folks. Uh, and best, uh, uh, so I want to thank all the folks from that team who've helped organize this, including um, Anne and Deb, Lauren and Drew, and Ed Mast and Joseph uh, for recruiting speakers and kind of organizing the schedule and making all of this work behind the scenes, doing um, tasks with speakers to make sure, like run-throughs to make sure everything works fine, works fine and organizing all the logistics. And they'll keep doing that too when we're in person. So uh, big thanks to that team. Our first talk for today is going to be from the FreeBSD Foundation. And it's going to start with Deb. And then she's going to, I think, hand it off to several other people. So I'll hand it off to Deb so she can start her talk. Oh, there we go. Anita, thanks, John. Um, so I'm Deb Goodkin. I'm the executive director of the FreeBSD Foundation, and I just want to say hi to everyone. Uh, welcome. Thank you for joining. I know for folks like me, this hour is totally perfect, but I know there's a lot of people out there who are actually watching us uh, in the early morning or late night hours. So we really appreciate you joining us. Um, I do also want to just welcome you to the third annual virtual summit. And like John mentioned, I mean, it is a little sad that we've, this is the third time we've had to do this virtually, uh, the vendor summit that is. And, but um, I think it definitely looks promising for next year and looking like we might have three developer and one vendor in-person summits over the year. So let's just keep our fingers crossed that that will happen. So. Right now, I'm going to share with you uh, who we are, who's the foundation, what we're doing, and then some of the plans for 2023. And um, like John mentioned, I'll hand it off to a few different team members who will talk about their specific areas and go into more detail and include also some of our plans for next year. So let's get started. I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen. And... Um, so I just have to find that button. There we go. Okay, so hopefully you see my slide presentation here. So who are we? Uh, we were founded back in March 2000, for the FreeBSC project. So we've been around for 22 years now. Um, we are 501c3, which is a US tax classification or IRS classification. And it means that we're a public charity, that we're here for the public good. Uh, we're based here in Boulder, Colorado, and that's where I'm coming from. But we are we actually have team and board members from around the world. And we're 100% funded by donations. So what is our purpose? We are here to serve you, the community, and the project. 
And so, I mean, the community is made up of folks doing so many different ways to contribute to FreeBSD from writing code to uh, testing the code, to writing blog posts, to doing videos. Uh, there's so many different ways that folks here and around the world are contributing to FreeBSD. And we wouldn't be here without you. Uh, our purpose is to um, step in and fill critical needs of the FreeBSD project. And we believe in the idea of people working together to create something bigger than themselves. So we are governed by a board of directors and they are located uh, in various areas around the world. Uh, this way you can have, um, you can see faces, names and their responsibilities are to uh, provide fiduciary uh, governance or responsibility for the foundation. And they also help us with the longer term um, vision and uh, strategic plans. Um, I post our org chart so you can just see our team members um, and the areas that they work in. And um, our team is comprised of full and part-time uh, people. And, but we also have a, a lot of contractors, some I've included here, as well as just others that I haven't included in the org chart. Uh, you'll probably notice that we do have an open position for software engineer, but it's, um, we have not uh, published that yet. So you'll see that in a few weeks. And then in 2023, if we get the funding, then we should have probably two to four openings. So just stay tuned to our, um, our jobs page on our website. So these are the five main areas that we support. And um, so Ed and Joe will go over the software development work that we've been supporting and some of the uh, future plans. Um, and Dixon will go over our advocacy, well, FreeBSD advocacy um, efforts. And so those two areas are where most of our funding go. So more than half our budget goes to software development. Um, we also have folks who are on uh, various functional teams, including security, um, infrastructure, we have continuous integration and other teams like that. And we do support the project with any type of legal support that they may need. So that includes um, if they have a question like on uh, patents or um, you know export laws, things like that. We also own the FreeBSD IP, which includes the trademarks. And then uh, we support virtual and in-person meetings and summits like this. And it's a way for uh, folks to get together and share ideas and um, get inspiration. And uh, whenever we have these types of events, we always leave more um, you know, energized, especially when we have in-person. So hopefully we will be able to go back to that soon. So um, various ways that we can help you. Uh, we can find a project that benefits FreeBSD and Joe will go into more detail about that. Uh, we do provide travel grants. And so we have an application on our website. So if you go to FreeBSD related event that uh, there's an opportunity to get help there. Uh, we do purchase hardware and software for the FreeBSD infrastructure. Uh, we'll promote the work that you're you're doing because we believe that's really important for um, for the world to know. And we're also working with uh, programs like the Risk Five Mentorship Program, which is new, Outreachy, and then also you know, just different university programs where we'll provide stipends. And that's an area that we really want to grow. So some of our 2023 plans are um, creating more. Um, that, like especially like professionally developed educational content to help bring on new folks to the project as well as help companies when they do hire folks to give them material to learn more about FreeBSD. Uh, to make it easier to adopt the use of FreeBSD for uh, individuals and for companies. And um, Ed will go more into this that we have a technology roadmap that we created a few years ago and it's always being revised and we look at uh, more, uh, you know, in the next year or two on implementing that. And so we get input from, um, you know, companies and just watch uh, market trends to help inform that. Um, improving the developer tools and to make it easier for developers and um, help them become more efficient. Uh, we are providing leadership training for the core team and uh, we're actually getting that ourselves too, to help us be more efficient. And then also improve the messaging that will help encourage um, other organizations and companies and individuals to use FreeBSD. 
Um, I always try to show uh, this chart every year to show our fundraising. Basically, it's our fundraising income versus what we spend. And as you'll see here, that we've only raised about 175,000 towards our goal of 1.4 million. And so um, it's beginning of November, and we really need to get the word out that we need funding to help. Um, to fund our efforts. Otherwise, we won't be able to hire next year and, and do the work that we really want to do. So if you could go to your companies and um, help get them to um, consider sponsoring us, that would be greatly appreciated. So how can you support us? So your, your company could shine a light on the FreeBSD project and uh, public, publicly talk about it and promote how you use FreeBSD, that would be so helpful. Uh, write a testimonial for us too, that would um, also show companies how uh, companies have successfully been using FreeBSD. And then donate. And so I'm gonna take you really quick to our, um, this is our website. So if you go to freebsdfoundation.org, and then here on the top, uh, you'll see, we have our donor list, but um, this is how you donate. and. Um, and it shows various ways what it doesn't include, but actually it may in the text somewhere, um, that most companies that donate, uh, give us larger donations, will either wire it to us or just do some type of electronic transfer. So that works uh, the best. And then we also have a partnership program for companies to get uh, more opportunities to have uh, community engagement and being able to promote the work that, you know, the work you're doing as well as uh, more about what your company is doing. And so you can go here to the partnership program and then you can read th through here on the different levels of um, partnerships. So I'll go back here and I will stop sharing my screen. I will be in the hallway track. So if you have any questions or you just want to chat, uh, feel free to, um, to find me there in that hall and I'll be happy to talk to you. So I'm gonna go ahead and hand this off to Anne who will talk about our advocacy work. Thank you. All right, my turn to share my screen. Okie doke. Let's see, we don't need sound for this one. All right. Hi everyone. Uh, Nice to be chatting with you at one of these events. Usually I'm behind the scenes, but uh, today I get to talk to folks. That's exciting. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about advocacy and education. Uh, Deb covered some of the stuff uh, that we do to advocate for FreeBSD, uh, but some of the other things that we do are um, creating programs and materials to help folks getting started up with FreeBSD. We have how-to guides. We did the FreeBSD Friday series. Um, we do various other sort of flyers and things to help folks really figure out how to get started with FreeBSD. Uh, we do promote the work that we and others do to improve the state of the operating system. Uh, we do that so that folks know FreeBSD is moving forward. Uh, we wanna make sure people understand the work that we're doing. And, and also when there's other big things happening, we wanna get that word out. Uh, she already talked about speaking at conferences and organizing events like this one. Uh, we do develop partnerships with other like-minded organizations so that we can make sure FreeBSD gets a broader audience that way. Um, we create programs and materials to help you spread the word. We have stickers and flyers and things like that that you can download off our website. Um, and of course, we do outreach to media, podcasts. Um, we go to student groups and meetups. And of course, the journal. Let's not forget about the FreeBSD journal. It's free. Uh, and the latest issue just came out yesterday. It's on security. Uh, it's a great way to see what's going on with FreeBSD and to spread the word about the project. So what is upcoming? Uh, we have... Four events on our calendar so far for 2023. Uh, FOSDEM's happening again in person, yay, in uh, Brussels. Uh, we hope to have a stand there. Scale's back at March um, in Pasadena. Scale's a great venue for us. We do an intro to a FreeBSD workshop there. We also like to have a talk. We usually have a booth. It's a great way to introduce people or sometimes remind them about FreeBSD. Uh, AsiaBSDCon is back in person in Tokyo in March, and they just announced the dates for BSD Canada 2023. Uh, May 17th and 20th. So we'll be hopefully have a Dev Summit there and we'll get to see you all in person again. So what else are we doing going forward? Um, we are focusing on more articles about how the project works and we also promote the work that we're doing. We want to make sure that people understand, you know, the latest one we did was an interview with the SEC team to see why they do what they do and how they do it. And that's important to make sure people understand how the project works, how it's different from Linux. 
Um, and so we're focusing on that. Deb already talked about the training courses and the community members. Um, we're continuing more introductory workshops at scale and other places like that. We really wanna focus on success stories this year um, and growing our social media presence that way. So that means we really want to come up with ways for you to tell your story. Storytelling is incredibly important so that people can relate to why using previous is a good thing. And I'm not talking about like novels and fables and fiction, but it's really talking about how FreeBSD has impacted you and, and your company. And so we do that through case studies, through community member spotlights. Um, so if you have a story to tell, or you think you might have a story to tell, please reach out to us because we can help you craft that story uh, and make sure people understand why FreeBSD isn't so important and what it's done for your organization and for you. And then of course we go through, you know, getting a new PR firm and getting more media attention that way, podcast interviews, that kind of thing. And finally, uh, the most, I think one of the most important things next year is it's the 30th anniversary of FreeBSD. So we'll be showcasing the impact that it's had on open source over the last 30 years and not just open source, but computing in general uh, through various um, special events and, and special uh, fireside chats and things like that. So stay tuned for the activities that are happening uh, to celebrate FreeBSD's big 3.0. So that is all I have uh, to talk about advocacy and education. You can always reach out to me at uh, marketing at FreeBSD Foundation or and with an E at uh, FreeBSD Foundation. If you have ideas that you'd like to share, I am always open. Uh, we have a lot of help in the community. And uh, I do want to do one quick shout out to those folks. Uh, thank you for those who are already helping. Um, spread the word. So thank you very much. And I will now hand it over to Joe. All right, okay, so let me share my screen. And hopefully you see my screen now and you can hear me well. Okay, so my plan is to tell you a little bit about the uh, external contracts that the foundation is funding. Uh, we currently have uh, seven different projects. So Kirk McCusick, the original author of UFS is working on a snapshot project. Uh, the foundation recognizes that these tools used to manage and configure virtual or non-virtual resources are important. Uh, so we are funding uh, Mina Galich to work on Cloud Init. We're also funding Zesper Chain to work on OpenStack. Uh, we've had uh, a long-term project with Wart Systems, uh, a number of contracts since the end of 2020 to improve LLDB. Bjorn Zeeb is working on improving wireless support on FreeBSD. John Baldwin is working on Beehive. And uh, Mitchell Horn has just recently started a, started a contract to improve uh, RISC-V. So a little bit of background about the uh, UFS uh, snapshot project that Kirk's working on. So. Uh, snapshots are available for UFS and they're available uh, with UFS with soft updates because the ability to take snapshots was added after uh, the work for soft updates. However, around 2010, when um, journal soft updates were added to UFS, that work wasn't integrated with the ability to take snapshots. And so that's exactly what this project is. It's uh, adding the ability to take snapshots for UFS with journal soft updates. And the, the main motivation for doing this is to um, avoid downtime. So when you have a snapshots with UFS, you can get reliable dumps on live file systems. Uh, you can also do background file system checks. So you don't have to bring the system down and, and you avoid downtime. So the project is broken up into two milestones. The first milestone is actually adding uh, the snapshot support for UFS with journal soft updates. Uh, Kurt's written lots of code already and uh, lots of that code has been reviewed. Uh, I list a few of the, the reviews here for those that are interested, a couple of the key reviews. Um, and Kurt tells us that uh, this milestone is very near completion. Uh, the second milestone, which will start after the first milestone is finished, is uh, extending the file system checks. And Kirk says, working part-time, he expects this, uh, the, the second milestone in the whole project to be done in about six months, so uh, approximately the middle of 2023. 
Uh, so cloud init is, is a standard tool for provisioning servers in the cloud. Uh, however, support is, is not as good when you get outside of, of uh, Linux. And so uh, we recognize that that's, that's uh, a reason that cloud providers could cite for not uh, supporting FreeBSD as, as, as tier one or not for board, uh, supporting FreeBSD at all. And so we want to change that. And the goal of this project is to enhance uh, support for CloudInit on FreeBSD to the same level as it is on, on Linux. And so at the foundation, we've learned that um, it's often uh, beneficial for both the contractor, the foundation users to divide these projects up into more, uh, to smaller, more manageable uh, milestones. And that's exactly what we've done here. Uh, uh, we've got six different milestones. So Mina is working to implement an if config parser. And so there was some discussion about this milestone during the proposal stage. It might be beneficial to, uh, to do this with libif config. So we might reevaluate that in the future, but this is the direction that we're going right now. Uh, Mina is also planning to implement a network class extraction, IPv6 configuration, login.conf parser, uh, DevD rules for Azure. And Mina is also going to uh, add some documentation to the, to the handbook for uh, her word productionizing FreeBSD. Uh, next project is, is OpenStack. So OpenStack is a system for supporting all different types of computing resources from virtual machines to uh, bare metal uh, hardware. But OpenStack is currently only unofficially supported on, uh, uh, unofficially supports FreeBSD as a guest. And that's the, the goal of this project, to, or the goal of this project is to support FreeBSD as an OpenStack host. And so uh, what Zestful plans to do to verify this work is set up uh, three different OpenStack clusters. Uh, the first cluster will be uh, at the University of Cambridge for the Cherry team. So uh, the team there works with these Cherry Morello, Morello boards that they often have to share with colleagues all over the world. And so having OpenStack could streamline that process of sharing those resources. Uh, the other two clusters, OpenStack clusters, are, are planned for the, the main freebsd.org cluster. The first is for resource management in the NetPerf cluster. And uh, Zesper also plans a mini cloud to be used for reference machines uh, uh, for, for basically FreeBSD development. So the idea here is that uh, developers need to uh, develop or test code on different branches and architectures. And so with OpenStack, they'll be able to self-serve these systems and fire them up. Uh, and they'll also have complete control. So hopefully this will uh, both assist developers and relieve a bit of a, a burden on cluster admin. So as I mentioned, uh, Morat Systems has been working on a long-term project with the foundation. Uh, the ultimate goal is to improve LLDB, so the debugger associated with LLVM, and make it feature complete with GB, the, the, the GNU debugger. And so one thing that Morat Systems has done a great job of is describing the work that they're doing. So if you want more detail, you can head over to their site, or you can also head to the foundation site where uh, that work has been uh, quite adequately or, or quite well summarized. Um, so just to give you a little bit of a flavor of the work that Morris has been doing, I can list off a few of the uh, develop, uh, deliverables. Uh, so before this work, the LLDB plugin model on FreeBC was obsolete and growing technical debt. So the old plugin model was replaced with a modern plugin using a client server layout. Uh, follow fork and follow vfork operations for implemented safe core functionality, support for debugging by a serial port, improved GDB protocol compatibility, support for FreeBSD kernel core dumps inside uh, L L LLDB live kernel debugging on FreeBSD. And uh, the current contract involves improving support for multi process debugging. Um, and it's divided into three different milestones. The first two milestones, which have been completed, are to implement the nonstop variant of GDB remote serial protocol. The second milestone involves implementing full support for multi-process protocol extensions in the LLDB server. 
And the third milestone involves uh, multi-processing or multi-process debugging support in the LLDB client. So as I mentioned, uh, Bjorn Z has been con contracted to improve wireless support on FreeBSD. Uh, much of that work has uh, been focused on uh, the 802.11 Linux KPI compatibility code. So the idea here is you take a driver that was developed for, for Linux and you incorporate it into FreeBSD with uh, little or no modifications at all. And so that work has shown to be uh, quite fruitful. Uh, other work that Bjorn's uh, done is work directly on drivers. So the uh, Intel, the IWL Wi-Fi driver, and he's also done work on uh, uh, drivers for chipset from other manufacturers like Realtek and Athros. And so Bjorn's uh, next focus is on doing whatever it takes to improve uh, wireless speeds. Uh, so some other work, uh, John Baldwin has been contracted just to uh, uh, dedicate an hour or two each week to deal with any uh, beehive issues in particular security issues that come up. So um, just to give you an idea of a recent PR that, that John uh, tackled was listed here where uh, some potentially uninitialized values could be sent to memcopy. Uh, some other work, um, <clears throat> we funded a uh, mentorship uh, through Risk Five International where um, uh, a developer named Plumer uh, worked with Mark Johnson to get syscaller. So that's a, uh, a, a directed uh, kernel fuzzer to, to work on FreeBSD RISC-V and that project was su successful. Uh, Plumer uh, uh, got it working and, and ran the fuzzer and, and actually has submitted a few uh, FreeBSD RISC-V specific bugs. Uh, we've also recently contracted Mitchell Horn to work on FreeBSD RISC-V. So Mitchell's plan is to add support for new hardware, improve support on different uh, platforms. He also plans um, uh, he also plans uh, general housekeeping, like de dealing with uh, bugs, reviewing code, that sort of thing. And he also plans to do a bit of uh, kernel documentation. So I also mentioned uh, Google Summer of Code. Obviously, this isn't something that the foundation directly funds, but we did. Uh, have some uh, contractors and employees uh, mentor uh, this summer. And we also administered the Google Summer of Code project for FreePSD. So if you want to read more about uh, the seven successful projects, you can go to the Google Summer of Code page. And uh, we're, we're hopeful that we're going to start a few new uh, projects. So Enwei Wu was a Google Summer of Code student that that Lee Wen mentored and he did some great work on, on wireless. So he plans to uh, work with Bjorn on, on other wireless improvements. Uh, we're still looking for someone to work on the handbook. So uh, if you're interested or know anyone, please get in touch with us. And I guess now is a good time to remind everyone that we're eager and, and open to uh, other project ideas or finding good projects that, that you think will, will help FreeBSD. So if you, if you have ideas or you're interested, please get in touch. You can read about the proposal uh, uh, process at that site or just uh, get in touch with me or, or any else, anyone else at the, at the foundation if you, if you have good ideas. So that is all from me. So I'll stop sharing. All right, thanks, Joe. Um, so I wanted to just talk uh, briefly about the technology roadmap. Um, as mentioned, I'm Ed Mast, the um, uh, Senior Director of Technology for the FreeBSD Foundation. And for the last couple of years, we've um, we've had a roadmap, a technology roadmap that we've shared in these, um, these forums. And we continue to... Um, uh, refine uh, the roadmap with feedback from FreeBSD users and companies using FreeBSD and uh, discussions at virtual summits, things like this, um, or uh, hopefully in-person summits again soon. Um, and so I just wanted to talk a little bit briefly about it. Um, and it, it sort of overlaps with the project funding work that, um, that Joe has just talked about. Um, the the roadmap um, covers both projects that we fund uh, through project grants and 
um, tasks that staff, uh, foundation staff take on directly. Um, so our roadmap is, um, is broadly speaking divided into four uh, theme areas right now, um, which are desktop and end user uh, focused, commodity servers, um, toolkit and appliances, and containers, containers containerization um, and virtualization. Um, so with respect to desktop and end user, um, Joe covered the work that we've um, funded under this um, this topic uh, in depth. Um, this this primarily Bjorn's work with uh, with 802.11 support, um, and that will continue uh, for the the immediate future. Um, we're also uh, looking at taking on um, work to help support package base and other packaging um, uh, other packaging work as necessary. Um, but we're still still sort of evaluating and, and figuring out what um, what we need to or what, what in what ways the foundation can best support that that effort. Um, commodity server primarily covers just ongoing support for tier one architectures. And so, um, you know, this has historically been x86 support. Um, and then for the last mm, year and a half or so and um, and extending for some additional time, it's included the work to bring ARM64 to tier one status. Um, and so Andy Turner has spent quite a bit of um, time uh, as a foundation staffer um, to improve ARM64 uh, support. Uh, in the not too distant future, we won't have ARM64 as tier one as a separate item within that um, within that focus area uh, because ARM64 is uh, is now just one of the the tier one supported architectures, and so um, uh, x86 and ARM64 are both covered under under tier one CPU support. Um, ARM64 as tier one extends a little bit uh, as a, a standalone item, just as there's um, additional sort of uh, follow-up items and, and minor improvements and things that are specifically ARM64 support, uh, ARM64 focused, uh, uh, ARM64 specific, as opposed to sort of just general improvements across um, architectures as a whole. Uh, toolkit and appliance, our effort to date has largely been focused on the debugger, as, um, as Joe mentioned. And performance uh, and diagnostic tooling is is where our focus um, will move next after uh, after the debugger work is um, uh, is wrapped up. And then finally, um, container containerization and virtualization. Um, as mentioned, we've uh, we funded John to do a little bit of work on improving security and some bug fixes within Beehive, um, and then. Moving forward, we um, we intend to look both at more um, more beehive work and ways that we can contribute to the um, uh, containerization story on FreeBSD that Doug Rabson um, uh, and Samuel Carp have um, sort of pioneered there. Um, so I think that's sort of the highlights of. Um, of what we have in uh, looking forward in the in the technology roadmap, and as I mentioned, we're very interested in collecting feedback um, from folks at events like this um, uh, on what areas uh, you think are important and uh, for FreeBSD and for the foundation's investment uh, as we go forward. Okay, thanks, Ed, and everyone else from the foundation um, who talked this time around. So that's the end of our first talk for today. Um, and now we're going to be headed off to our first break. I'm a little bit early, but that's okay. So we'll uh, just hang out over in the hallway track. I know I'll be over there for anybody who wants to go join us. Um, and we'll be back here in about uh, 40 minutes, I believe, is our next talk. Let me check. Yes, about 40 minutes. So see you then.
Welcome back, everybody, um, from our first break. Um, our next talk, of, our second talk of the day, is from Warner Losh, who's going to be talking about his adventures um, working with the Linux mm. kind of uh, interface for booting on systems. So I'm going to hand it over to Warner. OK, so you can hear me OK, right? OK, we have sound. You can hear me OK, right? Yes, we hear you, Warner. Don't yes. have audio if you're trying to talk, Warner. No, I can okay. hear. Great. So let me share my screen. And no, not that one. And go into presenting mode. There we go. Hey everybody, I'm Warner Wash. Today I'll be talking about my adventures in bootloading, um, specifically in getting FreeBSD's bootloader to work with Linux boot. I'll talk a little bit about all of these things. You've got to understand all the parts and maybe 
a tiny bit of my frustration when I get to the uh, lessons learned part of this um, talk. Anyway, what is Linux boot? Um, Linux boot is a way that um, has become more popular for booting systems. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, and I'll also talk about FreeBSD's boot process. We have kind of a funky little boot process that not everybody has. So uh, it's useful to have somewhere and it helps you understand what's going on. So I'll talk about it here. And then I'll talk about the things I needed to do to FreeBSD's bootloader to get it working um, as a Linux binary. And uh, finally, I'll talk a little bit about technical debt in the bootloader, meaning these are the things that were a pain that uh, I had to uh, work around. So anyway, what is Linux boot? Well, it's this generic term for booting Linux first and then loading the operating system after that. Um, it's designed to uh, have some kind of low-level init code uh, and then jump to a stripped-down version of the Linux kernel. This low-level boot code is uh, oftentimes uh, just available in binary format, which is why you have these two parts. Um, it's the result of a number of years where people have tried to basically boot their computer with Linux, starting with Linux BIOS, Core Boot, and a bunch of other things. Um, and it was really born out of frustration with the current bootloading processes. Booting is too slow if you EFI, there's a large attack surface, you can't really um, understand what uh, you've booted. In addition, different vendors wanted to uh, have a quicker path to market. And they figure if they want one loader, one driver for Linux, they don't have to write a driver for Linux and then also a driver for UEFI and Core Boot to get their systems up and running. Um, and it has a number of very mature uh, tools around it. Um, there, there's a number of good scripts to build the Linux boot image um, and also the initRD that goes along with that. The initRD, for those of you that don't know Linux, is basically the first root that a system has. And it, uh, RD stands for um, initial root um, disk. Uh, and it's a RAM disk. And all of this combined together fits into uh, the NOR or the NAND that you have on the, on the board. Um, this isn't so popular in x86, although it exists there. It's more popular for uh, ARM and RISC-V and, and other embedded uh, deployments. And that you know, leads me to, well, why would we want to do this? Um, well, um, like I said, it's common in embedded uh, environments, including one that um, uh, the company I work for would like to deploy into. Um, and so that's the reason I'm actually working on this. We're doing a deployment um, for ARM64 there. Um, but another reason is, uh, we found that doing scripting in UEFI was really, really hard. Doing it in the shell.efi um, was really hard for us to get the level of resilience we needed. So we thought that moving to having a shell scripting environment would be easier to develop for, easier to test for, and also easier to deploy and give us a more robust uh, model. Um, in addition, like I said, it's growing in popularity in the Linux world. It's been around for about five years in its current form. Uh, and uh, we'll need it to uh, deploy into a number of different environments. One of the side benefits is if you've got a cloud provider that's Linux only, you can boot to Linux and then use this to boot FreeBSD after you booted your Linux kernel in their hypervisor. Um, and we looked at other alternatives. One of the ideas that was presented early on was, hey, why don't you hack Linux so that it can exec EFI binaries? And I could do a whole talk on that. But basically, that the, the little, that wasn't a very flexible approach. And while there is a uh, uh, proof of concept of this, um, it's been abandoned and is largely um, not going on. Um, so, um, so there was a question about how passing. Um, file systems to the next level of the kernel. And I'll, and I'll get to that um, when I'm talking about the, the, the rest of this. So I'll, I'll answer that in a, in a those, see the questions coming in. Um, so Linux boot is both a project and a concept. So the, the Linux boot project has, um, you know, has this, this is, I took this diagram from their website and basically it shows, 
you take one of the popular bootloaders, say, and you take the low-level init code, which for UEFI is PEI and core boot is the ROM stage, U boot is SPL, and there's a number of other ones. Um, you have it do its thing, and then you jump to a copy of Linux that's already in, the, in memory that's initialized, and it will come up and boot like Linux does. It'll um, uh, enumerate the devices, set up the network stack, set up the storage stack, and all of that. And as part of that, in the init RAM FS or the init RD, um, there will be a program that eventually calls um, a system call called kexec load or kexec file. Both of these do the same thing. They take um, a data from a, a file and, and you tell the kernel where it will wind up uh, in physical memory. Uh, it's a fairly simple interface um, that presents some problems. And then once you're ready, once you have everything set, you call reboot uh, with um, a parameter that says, uh, don't reboot completely, just jump to that kernel that I just loaded. Um, and so once you've um, uh, you know, gotten into Linux and it runs its init script um, and the, 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 the init script actually can do a number of different things. It will load, typically load the mandatory Linux file systems. It will load different device drivers, potentially find a route that's over NFS or UA, uh, iSCSI or um, you know, load a RAID driver so you can boot off a kernel that's on this RAID system. Um, and it does all of that before calling the system calls I just talked about. And once you call the reboot K exec, the new kernel takes over. And this environment, um, it's basically a Linux, you know, running on a Linux distribution that's stripped down like a busy box or a U root instance. There's a number of other alternatives that um, time doesn't permit me to get into it. It's a very rich field. Um, and so that lets you have a lot more flexibility. Most of the scripts, you know, run the initial things and do a couple of checks and maybe pop up a menu that say, do you really want to do this or you want to run this, this or that? Um, and then it uh, runs either the kexec tools or the uroot tools that does the kexec. Um, there's some interesting advantages to this. It's just a Linux binary, just a standard Linux binary. It runs in uh, a Linux system that, in fact, you could even run it in the FreeBSD emulator. I'll, I'll get to that when I'm talking about debugging uh, loader.kboot um, here in a few minutes. Um, generally, there's no swapping available, so you have to do everything in memory. So this limits the size of things you can load sometimes if you have a low memory footprint. Uh, and you don't always have the full rich environment that you do. Um, for example, the environment I'm deploying and doesn't have dev mem or some of the other things that might be security concerns uh, exposed to it. Um, so you, there's some problems we have to work around with that. Uh, but one thing you do have access to is all the raw devices. Um, and either you can mount file systems on that or your bootloader can look at the raw device. Um, and before I get into all the, the nuts and bolts of that, I wanna talk a little bit about how FreeBSD boots and kind of the model and ideas behind how FreeBSD you know, goes about doing its thing. Generally firmware starts, you know, the system resets, it jumps to a vector, firmware does its thing, does the low level init, and then loads the first stage of the FreeBSD boot process. A long time ago, this was, you got one sector on this disk and you better make the most of it because that's all I'm gonna do for you. You gotta do the rest. And so um, that's why we have boot one and boot two and um, it eventually loads boot loader. Now with UEFI and some other systems, you can uh, load the loader directly. Um, so you don't have all of that initial stuff uh, to worry about, but you know, FreeBSD says, okay, in that case, Loader.efi, for example, um, it's the last stage of the boot and we'll just read the kernel in from there. Um, and bootloader sets up the environment the kernel expects is the short version, but basically we load all the loadable modules, we set all the environment, kernel environment variables, we do all the turn tunables, if there's firmware blobs or DTV blobs or any other auxiliary data, like on x86, we load memory maps in, in, with this mechanism. Uh, we do all of that. And then um, we set the CPU up in the way that the kernel expects. And that varies from system to system. And what the kernel expects and what the bootloader gives is kind of a co-evolved system. And so we have to match it just right uh, for the kernel to work. Once we have all of those things set up, 
uh, the loader jumps to the kernel entry point and it does its thing, um, does all the early initialization, probes devices, runs etcrc after mounting root, and away you go. And I'm not going to read all of these. This is a rather long list, but these are all the um, root environments that we support. Everything from a very simple and basic x86 on MBR with BIOS, um, all the way up to hypervisors, which um, use a different kernel entry point um, so they can get around some of the bootstrapping um, trampoline issues that I'll be talking about later. Um, and you know some more legacy things like booting on a Mac or booting the old U-boot uh, ABI. Um, and so we, re we support these on a number of different systems, um, network booting, just booting, all this stuff. And so there's a, a very wide, a large range of systems you have to think about when you're working in the bootloader. Um, so for the services the bootloader provides, we provide Lua scripting. We also have fourth there for some legacy users. Um, well, the bootloader also has a framework for saying these are the disks and these are the partitions. Uh, here are the network devices you have that you might be able to talk to and boot off of. Um, there's different compression and cryptographic surfaces available, particularly for ZFS. Um, and there's a lot of file system supported. I've listed a few here. UFS and ZFS are probably the most important. Maybe that file system, if you need to grab something uh, when you're doing a UEFI boot um, so that you can you know, load something before you know what your root is. Um, and you know, there's a number of other fiddly bits that um, the uh, boot services provide that uh, are more for user interface and not so much for the actual nut and symbols of booting. I'm not going to talk about those so much here because um, I didn't have to implement very many of them. So I thought I'd, I'd get a picture. This is kind of an overview of the rest of my talk, um, at least until the part where I start complaining about what the, the uh, technical debt we have in the bootloader is. Um, and I decided to simplify just a little um, uh, we've got a uh, um, we've got a uh, the UFEI uh, init code that calls the Linux kernel. The Linux kernel has an um, initial RAM disk that it runs out of, runs its scripts. Eventually, it will run loader.kboot. Um, and then loader.kboot looks at all the disks that are available uh, in the system and um, uh, figures out which one is, should be root. Um, usually some additional metadata is needed inside of the kroot um, kboot environment to, to get that, but not always. It can it can make a good guess. Once it's k-exec to the kernel, it runs at the RC and you have a free BSD system running. Okay. So it turns out we have an existing loader.kboot. And we have it because um, Nathan uh, White wrote a driver for it as part of the PS3 boot uh, sequence. He wrote it when we had, were running FreeBSD on the PS3. Um, and the reason it's called kboot is a long time ago there uh, for the PS3, there was a project called kboot that um, basically mimicked or we're mimicking what it did. And it, it basically loads a kernel and does a k exec. Um, and it used mostly old Linux interfaces. Linux's uh, k exec and pre boot environment have evolved a lot over time. And so um, it used uh, some of the older interfaces that needed to be updated. Um, and there was limited configurability. It knew there was booting on a PS3 and um, anything that didn't need to boot on a PS3 wasn't provided. So uh, while it was quite good for booting there, it didn't have the breadth that you need to boot a general uh, OS. Um, and it only ran on PowerPC. So um, there's no allowances for, well, we have ARM and AMD64 and RISC-V and all of this other stuff too. It was just you know very purpose-built. Um, and it didn't have really a good way to read files off of the host uh, file system. In this environment, you, there was nothing really of interest to read, but in my environment, it's actually very interesting to read off of that. Uh, finally, it could not run as a NIT. Um, something else had to start it and, and, and do all the initializations that a NIT does. Um, 
excuse me, do all the initializations that init does, and then um, run this program. So you couldn't have a, 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 an init RD that all, was, all it was was the FreeBSD bootloader and it would find everything else. So um, since I was just talking about init, that was one of the things I did. I wrote a mini init inside of the FreeBSD bootloader. So you can now run it as a Linux um, init. It mounts the file systems that are expected, um, does some signal handling and other uh, administrative trivia that it init wants. Um, but you don't have to run it as init. If it's not running as init, it doesn't do all of this stuff. So um, in addition to that, I reorganized the sources so we could have ARM64, AMD64, whatever else, PowerPC, um, RISC-V. Um, and I enhanced the device support. Um, the loader that I started with had uh, very basic support for just a device name. And you couldn't find the devices you have or list the devices or have them participate in ZFS at all. So um, it was kind of limited in what it could do. And we wanted to support booting off of ZFS. So I had to uh, implement a, a host device that could deal with all of that. I also um, wrote host FS, which is modeled a little bit after um, user boots host FS, but is tailored for the Linux environment. And it will go and let you read files off of the host um, if you want to read config files. Um, for the longest time, I was reading the kernel off of the host file so that I could um, not have to write, you know, worry about writing this, the, the disk model. It parses the command line. It supports, um, I have a, here about 20, uh, 30 system calls later in the slide deck. I say it's 22 because I actually counted. Um, and right now um, it works on ARM64. We're able to um, boot my um, my company's product and serve customers off of it in a laboratory environment. Um, AMD64 is maybe 80% done. AMD64, is, AMD64 grew out of x86, which um, is our oldest booting uh, kernel. And so it has a long history and requires more extensive tweaks to get the boot environment just so, and I don't have all those done yet. Um, it compiles for PowerPC, but I don't have a good test setup for that. Um, so it doesn't um, uh, run in that environment, or I haven't been able to test it. It still should work, but maybe it doesn't. Uh, one of the things I had to do to make this work was I had to build a Linux environment. And the last thing I wanted in our build world process was to reach out and install this Linux tool chain and that Linux tool chain and needing this dependency for that, all of this stuff. I wanted to keep it simple. So I wrote a simple C runtime environment, which for any binary you need to have. And all this does is when a binary is exact from the kernel, when it starts running, um, the kernel feeds it a lot of data and it does some initialization and then it eventually calls main um, with the RV RC that people are probably familiar with. That um, kernel to the um, early startup code and binary um, interface is different and different from system to system. So I wrote it at least for ARM, AMD64 and PowerPC. Um, I needed to do uh, system call wrappers, read, write, open, and, and those sorts of things so that the uh, program could interact with it. Um, and then I needed to do a linker script because our normal default binaries weren't quite right. And once I had all these pieces um, in place, I was able to then start working on um, loader.kboot, which um, you know some of these I took bits and pieces from the, the previous one um, and I enhanced uh, what was there so that it would support everything we need. Um, one of the cool things is I can run this binary in the Linux emulator that, or the Linux implementation that we have on FreeBSD. All the way up to where it calls kexec, I can test. I can attach debuggers to and do that all on my FreeBSD box. I don't need anything special uh, to do that. Uh, one of the other things I implemented was Termios. The original uh, loader.kboot didn't set the terminal at all. It, it relied on, on somebody else to do that. And if you're running as a NIT or um, even just running as a binary, um, you have to put the terminal in raw mode so that the individual characters on the boot, menu boot or boot menus uh, work like you expect. You, you want to hit one, you don't want to hit one return because who does that? Who would even know to do that unless you're some weird mutant uh, person who understands the low-level TTY driver stuff? Um, 
one of the things we want to do in our product is have some recovery over the internet or recovery over a private network. Um, the network configuration uh, portion of this is planned, um, but uh, hasn't been completed yet. Um, and so here's where I'll answer the one question that is um, currently in the Zoom chat. Um, the KXEC interface, actually, I think I'll insert it on the next slide. The KXEC interface um, basically is a very simple scatter gather list. It says, um, I have these um, areas in physical memory, or sorry, these areas in the virtual address space of this process that I'm running in. Um, and they're this size, and I want you to load the contents of them to this location in physical memory. So that's one piece you get. You get to set up the memory the way you want it. Although building all of that in memory is a bit of a challenge. Um, fortunately, this is one of the areas of the bootloader that um, doesn't have a lot of technical debt, so it was fairly easy to adapt the mechanisms that it had to load it to malloc memory rather than to the actual physical memory it's going to eventually. Um, and then you also have a transfer address. Um, and this transfer address, basically, um, you, for, for this project, uh, we're going to transfer to a trampoline. And then the trampoline takes the difference between how Linux boots and the start environment that it expects and how the FreeBSD kernel, uh, what, what it expects. And for ARM, the differences are fairly small. And for AMD64, the differences are larger. Um, so uh, generally, um, the processor is in a minimal mode. Now, um, we were lucky on uh, AMD64, it was already in long mode. So you didn't, I didn't have to climb um, the hill all the way from, it comes up in 16-bit mode and I have to go to 32-bit mode and from there into long mode, which our bootloader already does, but I didn't have to do any of that because that was all um, ready to go. The MMU is off. Uh, for AMD64, um, we have to boot with the MMU on so that the kernel can find where the bootloader is. Um, because with UAFI, we can't load it in a fixed location anymore because um, UAFI might be using some of the memory that we would normally load the kernel into. Um, and, you know, the trampoline takes care of, you know, setting all of this up on ARM64. There's some data we can't get to from our uh, program. So we copy that data in and then we jump to the kernel. Um, and it just jumps to the normal kernel entry point for the architecture that we find in the ELF header for the kernel that we loaded. You know, just like normal way that things are booted. Um, so the, the, the thing I wanna say on this slide is, um, you know, apart from the examples I've given, AMD64 is particularly complex. There's a number of different things, like I said, that have co-evolved that, oh, the bootloader will do this and pass it to the kernel and the kernel expects it. and uh, the code that does it is right now buried deep down inside um, one or two uh, modules. It's not very uh, reusable. So I've had to dig that out pieces at a time, but we don't need all of it because we're not loading to physical memory directly. So there's some indirection. So it needs to be adopted a little bit. And so uh, one of the hangups in my committing this to um, FreeBSD is that I haven't yet uh, refactored all of this so that it's nice and reusable. Um, so one of the things that makes this also challenging is in Linux, it starts and it's the whole thing. The whole ballgame is, is where it starts. But in FreeBSD, um, we pass all the loadable modules, the tunables, um, different tables of memory locations, uh, DTB blobs, all of this gets passed in through the, the, the loader interface. So we have to get that all set up and working before we call the kernel entry point. Um, UEFI requires extra care, normally because we have to preserve um, the sys table so we can call back to it at runtime, preserve the uh, memory tables and so forth. And in this environment, it's even worse because um, we don't know what the UEFI tables is. We have to get that from Linux before we jump into this environment. Um, and all of this handoff is not really documented anywhere. If you look at the code, you'll find it by reading the code, not because there's nice comments in the code even necessarily. Some places are well commented and say, yeah, we load the kernel here. It's on a two meg boundary and we um, 
sniff through the um, TLB or the NMU tables to figure out where exactly it is in physical memory so we can kick off our initialization of PMAP with you know, the memory in the right place and all this other stuff. And the big hole maybe at the beginning of memory, um, we can you know, free that or have that not be marked as reserved when we, you know, so we can use that later in, in memory when we start uh, pbooting. So, um, and this is an area, like I said, the bootloader is not super modular in this. There was a the way we loaded and there was only one the way we loaded on any given platform. And now on x86, we've got um, several different ways to boot that go through the bootloader. Um, and so we have to make it a little bit more modular. Um, so on the Linux side, doing this in the Linux world, what were some of the things that um, I noticed and liked about it or didn't like about it? Well, um, the KXEC load system call, which is the basis for all of this, is very well documented. Um, you don't have to guess a number of things, um, but it assumes a start environment that's very similar to the Linux kernel. The Linux kernel leaves, um, you know, unwinds everything in it and leaves things around in a way that the um, subsequent kernels can use. And so there's a boot environment that it expects. And that's not very well documented. There's no certainly overview document of this. Certain aspects of it, certain details of it are well documented, but you have to know that you need those details in order to, to do that. And usually you don't find that you needed the detail until you are debugging a panic um, in FreeBSD. Um, so to do this project, I had to, to read the Linux kernel a lot, read the different um, KXEC tools and uroot, um, you know, and to find the information I should go looking for. Um, but, you know, finding it, part of what made it tricky is you needed to go see what these programs did. And it's like, well, why are they doing that? And then, you know, work backwards. Oh, is there a documented interface for that? Or do I find this in the, only in the Linux kernel? Um, it's uh, tedious, tricky and involved. Um, each architecture, um, you know, took me a, a week or two, uh, maybe three to understand and implement. Um, each new one, is, if, after I get some of the refactoring done, might be a little bit easier, but it's still, um, it's not something you can uh, you know, knock out in an afternoon. Um, and also there's this EFI piece that um, you have to worry about. Um, you know, how do I get the, when Linux boot um, KXX, it leaves part of itself in memory to handle the UEFI runtime calls that the operating system needs to make. What time is it? Please reboot me, set these variables, although those that isn't usually supported. So, um, you know, it, the, the environment has some unique um, processes. And, you know, in some ways, a lot of people tell, oh yeah, it's simpler than UEFI. If you look at the different um, slide presentations on why you boot, um, but it is every bit as complicated as UEFI. Um, it does have the advantage of more eyes are looking at it, but you have a different, set of problems rather than no problems. All those eyes aren't perfect. The Linux kernel is still very big. Um, and so it's, uh, you know, the, 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 it's troublesome. And all of this stuff, the K exec to Linux, new Linux kernel handoff, um, just like our bootloader co-evolved with Linux. And some of people along the way documented it well, and some people didn't. And it's all these little fiddly bits that, um, you know, make it a, a bit of a challenge to do. Um, the, the nice thing though, in a lot of ways, um, uh, from a reuse point of view in the bootloader, since it is a lot like UEFI, um, in the handoff has to be the same, we can reuse a lot of that code and the environment has to be the same. We can reuse a good part of that code, although some has to be rewritten. Um, so from that perspective, it's good. And if you're doing another UEFI-like um, architecture, uh, the, the process to do this um, is uh, simpler. Now, in the bootloader itself, um, the parts of the, like I said, parts of the code are very modular. Like if I'm reading the, the kernel in, that part's really modular. There's enough of function calls, I can replace those um, and it works great. Other parts of the system aren't so great. Um, we really haven't had a need to, for example, list all the disk devices. And so 
um, there's no way to do that. There's no way to list all the disk partitions. And so when you need to uh, support things like ZFS, you have to write a thing that looks at the list that your uh, module or model specific code created just for the purpose of walking through all the disks so that ZFS can find all the disks. We don't have a general mechanism to do that. It would be useful to have that. Also, um, there are bits of the code that assume that um, it uses a struct disk with partition table, which is a reasonable assumption for all the other platforms that we have because we don't have any services to do that. But Linux provides the partition services and works better if you go through and use them rather than using the raw disk for everything. Um, and so you need to keep different information around when you have the lists of disks and partitions um, in the Linux world than you do in the um, you know, more traditional boot environments, but you still have a list and it still should be possible to iterate through the list to look for things or do things for each item in the list or for each item that it finds. And, and, and that's one of the areas that we could use some work on. Um, the other problem with the bootloaders, a lot of it was done with cut and paste. I have this bootloader that works. I have an environment that's kind of sort of similar. I'll copy all of that code. I'll delete the stuff I don't need. I'll add the stuff I do need. I'll leave the common stuff and I'll never refactor and I'll get on with my life. Um, and you know, the first couple of times you do that, it isn't a big deal, but you know, when you do it for um, user boot and then for UEFI and a little bit in U-boot, um, you, you wind up with a lot of duplicated code that you have to redo for your new platform or copy again for your new platform. Um, and that's you know, not really a good thing. Um, and one of the one of the problems with the bootloader today um, is that the scripting is a little weak. Um, it dates from a time when we had Forth as scripting, and not too many people knew Forth, so they leaned more, leaned more heavily on, "Oh, we'll just do it in in straight code in C," rather than making these modular pieces that the scripts load uh, themselves. And so, um, if you want to do almost the same thing that we do today, except something a little different for your platform, that becomes kind of difficult. Now that we have Lua, we might want to um, look at making it more scriptable than it is today, because that would be useful um, in the environment I'm trying to deploy to, where I need to see if this exists or that exists, and you know, conditionally load this or that based on that, and set different parameters based on things I find in the in the boot that isn't I wound up doing it in C code, but it doesn't seem like that's the right place to do that. Um, <clears throat> another problem is there are probably 80 ways to boot FreeBSD today. Um, 70 of them probably go through the bootloader. And, and, and testing all 70 of those is a challenge because we don't have scripts to um, create it all. I've created some scripting that does some things for x86, but um, you know, on ARM, there's nothing, and so we need uh, more. Um, we need we need some more stuff there. I've written a little bit as part of this project, but we need to look at you know how do we um, how do we flesh it out and make sure it's complete, and also how do we hook it into the user tests um, uh, ATF framework that we use for testing everything else because it's not hooked up into that. Um, and for the vast majority of the things you're booting, if you can boot the kernel and run. Uh, even a script that echoes hello world, um, the bootloader works. So we don't need to do a whole lot um, in terms of running FreeBSD, but you know there's a number of different ways to do that, a number of QMU commands to do that, or Beehive commands or whatever, however we're going to, to, to manage that. And that makes it a little bit tricky. Um, and like I, like I alluded to, some things are well abstracted, like copy in and copy out is well abstracted. But the disk inter uh, the device interface isn't as well abstracted. So um, a lot of the code has to assume things that are a little bit dangerous and layering violations. Like the ZFS code assumes that we have a particular type of disk and you can use particular type of interfaces to get the list of partitions. And while that's what was there, it's probably not where it should be. Um, because we also have jelly code that um, needs to look for partitions as well. Um, and it hooks into a different part of the system at a different time. and um, it does things differently, but it's basically the same thing. Which of these partitions that I have are jellies? What ones do I need to get keys for? When do I need to get the keys? All of this stuff um, is, uh, uh, you know, kind of purpose built for individual features rather than having a, uh, a nice abstract framework 
um, behind the scenes. Um, and I just realized I forgot to answer the question of how do we communicate the handoff um, between the K exec and the um, kernel, whether it's NFS or whatever. Um, and it turns out we do that with the same way that we normally do. We pass in uh, a, um, a VFS mount route from that has that information that the kernel can use then to mount the root uh, file system. Sorry, I, I planned on doing that a few slides ago, but I'm to my end of the talk and it's time for questions. I heard a few dings on um, IRC, but I have only seen the one question that um, was in um, uh, the Q and A for Zoom. So you guys probably know what my email address is. Um, so I don't need to uh, keep that up. So let me stop sharing and see if there are other questions that I can uh, read from IRC or if there are um, you know, other things that people would uh, <clears throat> like to um, to ask now. Um, I see that people are complaining about my complaining uh, on IRC. So, yay, I won that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I tried to frame it as, you know, this is these are things we can do to improve it, to make it easier. Not that I think there necessarily will be additional boot environments, but every time we think, every time we've thought we're done in the past, there's a new one that comes along. So, you know, I think it would behoove, it would be good to catch up on some of the technical debt that we have. Um, so uh, I have a couple minutes, I see maybe seven minutes for additional questions that people might have. Um, but like I said, I'm not um, seeing them in Zoom. Uh, someone has a, you have a Zoom question actually. Um, someone's asked if it would make sense to re-implement dev match in the bootloader, which I, I will, we actually, at least in the x86 bootloader, we actually have some very vestigial things that never went anywhere that tries to enumerate PCI devices and old ESA plug and play to, with an eye towards that. But I'll let you answer the question. Um, right. So um, for x86, yeah, there's a bunch of vestigial stuff that aspirationally we're headed in that direction and never panned out. Um, I think it's a great idea. I, in fact, um, uh, Emmanuel Vadu, Manu, um, implemented this for FDT devices um, in the bootloader already. Um, it looks at the DTB and finds all the devices and loads the devices from the bootloader that it needs uh, so that uh, we can um, have a slimmed down kernel. Um, one of the destinations in mind was exactly that, but also with PCI and USB and everything else that we at least needed to boot to get to the point where we could do deathmatch. I think it makes good sense to still have the split between the bootloader and user land. And the reason for that is you want to start booting as quickly as possible in a lot of cases. And the more binaries that you load for random things you might happen to have plugged in uh, to your system, slows it down and introduces more points of failure to that. So I still think the split is good and I would love to review patches um, that implemented this on, you know, more the x86, PCI, USB side, um, rather than just the FDT patches we have. ACPI might be another area that we could do this with. Then do you have a question from Ed Mast on IRC? Mm -hmm. um, he's asked, do you see this support being used in use cases beyond what you're currently investigating? I mentioned one already, um, but yes, I do. Like the current use case I have is we have an interesting system that we want to boot on and um, we can run a Linux script and the Linux kernel there runs, uh, is a, a Linux boot environment and everybody else that's integrating uh, boots Linux, we're booting FreeBSD for our particular thing. And, um, Sorry, that's the doorbell and annoying. Um, the other places I see it possibly useful for, um, I mentioned a, a little bit earlier the, in the cloud computing. If you have an image that's a Linux image, but you want to run FreeBSD there and they haven't gotten around to doing anything with that, this could be a useful bootstrap for that environment. Or any um, 
computers or uh, environments where you only have Linux and I, maybe in like a low end embedded device where Linux boots, but you want to boot FreeBSD, well, you can boot Linux, run the loader.k uh, boot as part of um, the early boot there and run FreeBSD on that. Um, the other case that I have in mind um, that I'm doing a lot of is um, I also um, do uh, booting um, for testing on, um, <clears throat> what am I trying to say? Oh, testing in a uh, continuous integration environment. One of the things that um, I need to do is to, to, to Linux boot um, in, uh, to make sure the Linux boot is working with the scripts that I've written. But if we've got in CI, all we have is a Linux container, um, maybe uh, we can use this to um, boot FreeBSD inside of that. Um, I know I'm hand waving a lot, but um, you know that might also be an area where it's a Linux only environment, but we could K exec FreeBSD to do the final stage of testing or, or, or something. So there's potential there. I've not investigated all the places we could use this, but if it's running Linux now, potentially we could use it to run FreeBSD or to develop a kernel for FreeBSD or for early boot uh, bring up on a new system might also be useful. So those are the areas that um, beyond just, hey, I'd like to K boot, you know, I'd like, I have an environment where the only way to run FreeBSD is to do this. Um, and I'd like to integrate into that environment or ecosystem. Um, you know, there's other things that, um, fit that fairly well that we could use it for. So. Yeah, the CI one, I was actually going to follow up and ask, but you already answered it. Cause that's <clears throat> the one I had thought of too, is our, our problem of needing to build an OS image that we want to run inside of a CI, <laughs> you know, we don't want to get the CI. So that, that would be an interesting trick. Yeah, and um, if we could build an image inside of Linux and then K-exec it at the end, yep. that might also be interesting as well, rather than doing the nested virtualization we might have to do. Yeah, that's what I was thinking of. You would so, have to, I guess it'd have to be like a RAM desk or something that you would build, but you could make it work. Exactly. And that way, you know, it's completely ephemeral and you could do that. Um, you know, it might even be interesting to have a, um, have this on our installer um, so that, uh, you know, people that have a Linux system could, you know, run a Linux command, uh, you know, mount the CD. CD, you know, the CD yep. image, but, you know, they could mount the CD and, you know, run, um, you know, loader.k boot and it boots the FreeBSD installer and you could install from there. That might also be an interesting um, way we could integrate this further once it's more widely deployed. And that last 20% that's going to take me a way too long on AMD64 is taken care of. So the other thing I like about this um, is uh, since I'm running it in QEMU, I can use it to um, attach uh, GDB directly to QEMU rather than having to go through a serial port to debug the kernel. Oh, yeah. But, but you don't need Linux boot for that, but it's been a very useful thing when I'm debugging Linux boot. The other thing, um, I have two modes that I tested on. Um, one is um, booting the Linux boot kernel directly or Linux kernel directly. Um, in QEMU where there's no BIOS even. Um, and that works fairly well and we can run, um, <clears throat> but you don't get any UAFI or anything. And um, one of the areas of integration in that boot, I don't pass the memory map in correctly today. So FreeBSD takes a memory map and assumes it's good because it has to, and then bad things happen. It's one of the problems I need to look at for AMD64. So. Yeah, one of the thoughts I had is um, right now in other architectures, the kernel is at least somewhat relocatable. For example, in ARM64 and low core, we just assume that we have some kind of mapping where virtual addresses equal physical addresses, and we can kind of cope and, and figure out where we are and kind of cope. Um, risk five right. is the same way. Whereas x86, like kernel load is a constant that gets compiled in. And I, I don't I wonder, having a little more experience now mm -hmm. myself with our other architectures, how hard it would be to at least fix that part of our kernel so that we could learn what physical address we're at and cope with it. That would that would eliminate the need actually, for the aging hack and so forth. Right, right. So right now we link to a particular address yep. and we um, assume that we're going to run that in a virtual environment. And um, one of the things that um, Constantine has done recently 
is basically kind of what you suggest. He looks at the um, uh, MMU tables to find out what the physical address of the underlying pages are to find out where we're loaded. And you have to load at a two meg offset, just like on ARM. It's a little less flexible and a little less obvious that we're doing it. Mm -hmm. um, and it was kind of, um, I didn't do things with an eye, like you're saying, to having a relocatable kernel that we could get rid of some of the gross and ugly kludges that we have so we can load modules. I mean, that is an area that we could look at independent of this work, but kind of you know related to it in the same area. Okay, well, it's 1030. Um, well, it's in my time zone. Different people's time zones are different, but it is the end of the slot. I'm going to check to see if there are any last minute questions. I don't see any. Um, but maybe we can talk more about relocatable kernels over in the hallway track if you have time. Um, but thank you very much, Warner. Oh, you bet. I'll jump into the hallway track if I can find it in my email and we can chat there. All right. Thanks, Thanks everybody. You've been a lovely audience. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, Warner. Uh, so we are going to uh, take our next break and we'll be back in about 30 minutes for a talk um, from folks at Microsoft on using FreeBSD on Hyper-V, but for, but for ARM64 rather than x86. So we'll see you all back here in about a half hour. Thank you.
Well, hello, everyone, and welcome back from our break. Our next talk for today is going to be from a couple of folks at Microsoft, and they'll be talking about using FreeBSD with Hyper-V on ARM64. Hi, everyone. So I am Shaurodip, and me and Oi, Oi Hu from Microsoft, we are working on bringing up uh, FreeBSD on Azure ARM64 architecture. So currently this work is still under process. We have done the phase one and uh, that uh, work we'll be discussing here and phase two is uh, on the way. So without further delay, I will just share my presentation here. I hope the uh, presentation is clear and visible. So let me know if there is any problem with the presentation. We can see it, although it's in uh, preview mode rather than full screen. Okay, okay. Uh, let me try to make it full screen. Give me a minute. No, problem, no worries. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Um, yeah, I guess it is, uh, I'm going to find the view button because of this task bar of the zoom on top. <laughs> uh, it can be done from this side out. Screen, see slides. I'm not sure uh, how to get the view button here. It is not coming here, actually. Uh, anyway, uh, so, yeah. So uh, in Microsoft, uh, we are working on FreeBSD for last couple of years. We have already got FreeBSD on x86 platform of Azure. And as Microsoft has already decided and started offering ARM64 on Azure, so uh, on track with that, we are working on bringing up FreeBSD on that. For that, the work is mostly on the Hyper-V drivers of uh, FreeBSD. So, yeah, so, uh, this is the current architecture of FreeBSD, uh, sorry, uh, of Hyper-V in FreeBSD. If you see, uh, according to the new bus architecture, we have got uh, Nexus device and child of the Nexus, we have SAPI. And under SAPI, we have got VMBus Race and SAPI container. VMBus Race owns the Swiss Race IRQ resource and SAPI container owns SysRace MIM from the SAPI table. Under SAPI container, we have got VMBus and store VSC, NET VSC, HVUtils, and PCIV, that is VMBus PCIV. Under that, we have PCI. Let's go to the next slide. So this was the uh, earlier or current existing Hyper-V device driver layout inside FreeBSD source code. We have VMBus inside which the uh, all the VMBus related uh, source codes are present. Inside that we have uh, currently AMD64 and i386, which were having the uh, x86 uh, specific hyper call entries and VMBus IDT vectors. Then we had stored VSC for the synthetic SCSI controller driver, NET VSC for synthetic network controller driver, PCIB for the PCI bridge driver for SRIOV as well as pass through for the accelerated networking. Then we have 
input where we have the synthetic keyboard drivers, utilities, where the uh, time synchronization driver and key, uh, key value driver all are present. And then we have include where the header files, generic header files are present, which are exposed by the Vimbus for the applications. Now we have uh, modified it uh, to uh, accommodate the ARM uh, based changes, which we have done. So now we have included a new directory inside Vimbus that is ARC64, which is containing Vimbus ARC64.c, Hyper-V underscore rake dot H, Hyper-V MacDip H, Hyper-V MacDip C, and Hyper-V ARC64. These files are created, which contain the specific code bases for ARM64 architecture. So VMBus ARC64 contains new interrupt handler, handler, which we have introduced now uh, for uh, ARC64. That setup and tear down codes are inside this ARC64, VMBus ARC64.c. Then we have Hyper-V ARC64.c, which contains a code for Hyper-V identification as well as the page setup. Then we have Hyper-V MacTip.c, which contains new hyper calls for ARM64 Hyper-V. And we have Hyper-V Rake.h, which contains ARM64 specific synthetic MSR values. Now let's go to the next slide. Along with that, we have also introduced a new full directory for x86, that is a x86, and name is x86, which contains Vimbus x86.c, Hyper-V x86.c, Hyper-V rake.h, and Hyper-V magdip.h. These are applicable for both i386 as well as for AMD64 architecture. That's why we have created this uh, generic name x86 here. And also we have introduced new files in uh, common directory of Vimbus, that is Hyper-V common rig.h, which contains the common synthetic register, uh, MSR values for the Hyper-V, which are applicable for both x86, uh, x86 as well as for the ARC64, ARM64. We have taken this approach to re-architect the code base to avoid the duplicacy or the redundancy of the code and to make it for the modular. While we started doing this work, one of the big challenge which we have got was uh, how to communicate with the Hyper-V for the hyper calls. Because uh, in case of x86, we have got WRMSR and RDMSR, which is not present in uh, ARM64. So we need to use uh, to different commands, which is HV call set VP registers, hyper call, and HV call set VP register hyper call for setting and getting the MSR values. And to do that, we need to use ARM SMCCC HVC AVIs. As we can see from the picture on the right side, that in ARM, use the space runs on the EL0 kernel runs on the EL1 and hypervisor, or here in case of uh, Azure, the Hyper-V runs on the EL2. So from EL1 to EL2, the communication happens through ARM SMCCC HVC. In FreeBSD, we had uh, ARM SMCCC HVC, but it was still the version level one. But we required 1.2 to access the registers beyond A0 to A3. The limitation of uh, SMCCC version one is that it can, you can, you are only allowed to access the registers of Hyper-V through a VP from A0 to A3. But when we are doing the get VP registers, the values get set after A3. So it's from A4 to A7. So, we, for this purpose, we have implemented SMCCC 1.2, and these are available for all users. 
if we want to see the code changes, these are present in the below mentioned links. Uh, so I'm going to the next slide. Now, as I mentioned, we have Hyper-V.C. So Hyper-V is, uh, Hyper-V identification or Hyper-V loading happens during the sys init of, uh, when we are going for the sys init uh, of the Hyper-V, uh, Hypervisor. So sys init level Hypervisor, when we are going that time, this uh, Hyper-V identification happens. And there uh, we have, uh, introduced this, use this uh, new hyper calls to get the hyper features, the recommendations, as well as to identify the platform, whether it is hyper V or not. Without that, non hyper V platforms will get into trouble because we are using this uh, um, SMCCC 1.2 to set and get the attributes. And those are not, uh, available in older platforms or 32-bit uh, platforms. So to avoid that, we need to identify the platform. Now, in case of x86, we had CPU ID. Using that, we can identify, and we were identifying that whether the platform is um, Hyper-V or not. Now, as it is not present in this, so we had another small challenge. So what we have done this time, that we have, uh, we try to use SCPI FADT, that is the fixed added table to identify. So in SCPI FADT, uh, in SCPI version six, we have an attribute hypervisor ID through which we can get what is the hypervisor ID, which in our case is MS Hyper-V. Now, another challenge was when the Hyper-V is getting loaded, that time SCPI is still not mapped to the, from the physical memory to the kernel, uh, uh, the kernel memory. So we had to do that and we have uh, then using the mapped address, we get the hypervisor ID and we overcome the challenge of identifying the Hyper-V. Another thing which is different in very much in case of uh, the way x86 was working in Hyper-V uh, FreeBSD is that in uh, x86, we were using synthetic timer of Hyper-V, but in uh, ARM, Hyper-V does not provide the synthetic timer. So at uh, Hyper-V, our host actually tries to use the uh, ARM architecture uh, timer counter. So we uh, use the generic counter implementation of FreeBSD for the timer events and we uh, taken out this Hyper-V uh, time synchronization, all these codes from the Hyper-V.c. We have kept it inside the x86 for directory and generic Hyper-V does not now contain these changes. As uh, also uh, in this, uh, we have also got the page setup. So we have this uh, VADDR and PADDS setup. Those are still there, but in x86, we had also uh, this uh, page setup for hypercall context, which is not applicable because uh, in ARM. So we have moved them in the Hyper-V x86. Going to the next slide. See, if we see this is the, so if we want to understand that in uh, Microsoft Hyper-V, the base, the most important part is the Vimbus. So through VMBus, guest OS communicates with the host and host offers different information to guest uh, through the channel. What is standard channel is nothing but a shared memory between the host and uh, guest. In guest in, our, in this case is FreeBSD and child partition. And to synchronize this communication or to uh, notify guest OS, about any channel communication, we use uh, synthetic interrupt or cynic, which comes through this hypervisor. So we 
uh, had uh, so already in x86 this synthetic interrupt was implemented but it was done through lapic which i will be discussing in the next slides which we have moved away from so in vm bus interrupt handling uh, in x86 we were using uh, lapic and free idt vector for hyper v uh, iso in ARM64, VMBus uses the interrupt mentioned in the CRS of a separate table uh, under VMBus. As if you can see in the right side of the slide, we have just taken a snippet from the SCPI DSDT, where we can see that inside uh, VMBus, we have the CRS under which we have got interrupt mentioned, which is in case of ARM, is 0x12, that is 18 in decimal. Now in uh, x86, this value was 0x5, which is pretty uh, small to use in x86 architecture. So what that time had been done is uh, Fimbus was using uh, LAPIC and using LAPIC, it was uh, setting up the IDT vector by finding a free IDT vector entry. And then Scenic was using that to communicate with the uh, guest OS. In ARM, we don't uh, we can we don't, don't uh, have that thing. So we are going we had to use this interrupt mention in the SCPI. So now there was a challenge because of the new bus architecture which I've shown already in the slide one. Uh, this resource in the VM bus code this uh, interrupt resource is owned by a uh, stub or uh, dummy device that is known as VMBus Race, which is a direct child of SCPI. And VMBus is a child of SCPI sys container, which owns the resource of uh, uh, sysrace mem for the MMIO. This is applicable for the Gen2, by the way, Gen2 Hyper-V. Because in cause uh, ARM64 offering is on the Gen2, not on the Gen1 Hyper-V. Now to access this resource from the VMBus race, what we have done because we had to use the new bus architectures uh, thing. So an SCPI container we need to use for the MMIU. So we kept that same parent-child relationship, but to allocate the resource from the for the IRQ, we have used this dev class gate device. And from there, once we have got the VMBus uh, race dev handle, we have used that to uh, to pass it for the bus alloc resource any for the sys race IRQ. And then we have introduced three new attributes in VMBus soft C. Uh, that is I race, I cookie, and vector. So the resource which is getting allocated is getting stored in the VMBus soft C I race. Uh, going to the next slide. Now, once we have got successfully this IRS resource, what we have done, because we need the actual IRQ number present in the SCPI table. So we had used this RMN or resource manager get virtual to get the IRQ number. And we have set it for ARM. We're setting it in the VMBus IDT fake. Earlier in this IDT fake, it was the uh, uh, IDT vector entry, uh, which were which we are getting through the LAPIC. So in case of ARM, we are getting we are setting it through this IRQ data IRQ. So these changes are in this uh, VMBus arc64.c, and LAPIC based IDT vector setup has been moved in the VMBus x86.c. Now. Uh, currently, we are working on. So now, after this changes, uh, VM uh, Hyper uh, sorry FreeBSD is able to boot up and can get installed on uh, Hyper V or Azure Gen2. But we, as I mentioned, we have this accelerator networking, and for which we use SRIOV and PCI pass through. For that, we have this VMBus PCIB bridge driver. Uh, so we are working right now on getting this PCIB to work on ARM64. 
there are some certain challenges because the way in x86 uh, vm bus pcib was mapping the msix was through uh, the nexus device of x86 which was taking care of msix uh, allocation but in arm 64 we don't have that in the nexus so we are going to implement the mapping the allocation uh, of msix inside directly inside the vm bus pcib without using the dev methods of uh, the parent device so hyper v does not emulate the full search pcib it is just for this as i mentioned the mapping and the setting up the bars for the srif or the password device which we are uh, getting the mmio which we are getting through the SCPI table and handling the PCI configuration space access. So once this uh, VMBus PCIB work is done, we will have SRIOV and VME enabled and free. We have uh, got the uh, FreeBSD installation window. And once this is installed, so yeah, I have just cropped that part installation process. Once it is installed, we can see that it will be having this. Uh, we are restarting after the installation. Yeah. So once it is restarted, we will have from the boot from the uh, storage. And yeah, uh, so we are inside the first successful uh, free VSD arm Hyper-V. And we can ping now and the DF manage ace and all those things are working. Yeah, so it is on the ARM64, it is running. So yeah, that's all from my presentation. So yeah, yeah. Thank you everyone for watching this uh, presentation. Yeah, and if you have any questions now, yeah, we can take this, take the questions here. Sure, so I have one question, which is I saw you mentioned um, using SROV for NVMe storage, are there any other devices that you plan to pass through? Or is it is that the only one you're currently planning to, to use with SROV? Yeah, there are two things. One is uh, we are network device that is Melanox. Melanox NIC is getting used in uh, Azure. So that will be done through the, that will be coming for the pass through for accelerated networking and uh, NVMe definitely for the storage. Okay. Any other question? I'll, other I'm question? going to look on IRC and I'll, I'll see if any pop up in the next minute or so. If I'll, I'll relay them if they do. Okay. Okay. So, yeah, I and you can definitely contact me or way uh, over email. So, uh, my email is uh, if I share the screen, yeah, one minute. Let me share the screen. <laughs> Once more, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. So this is me and we. Uh, so our email IDs are mentioned here, as well as I am uh, available on IRC of on the FreeBSD IRC. So you can ping me there as well, and you can contact we as well on the on any questions. Uh, thank you. Thanks for being such a nice audience. Thank you, everyone. I'm stopping the right. sharing. Yeah. So we'll go ahead and take our, I think it's our last break of the day. I and mean, we have one more talk coming up. Um, from Pavel talking about NVIDIA lists, which are a neat little tool API we have in FreeBSD that came over from as part of the, the CFS and DTrace work. I know I've used it in Beehive, for example. Um, but yeah, we're going to take our break. Our next, I think it's about a 40-minute break that we'll take, and we'll be back um, <clears throat> for our next talk as it is on the schedule. So I'll see you all on the hallway track, and we'll be back in a little while.
<laughs> okay, welcome back, everybody. Um, so we have one more talk for today, uh, which is going to be from Pavel talking about Envy lists. So I'll turn it over to Pavel if you're ready. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Okay, let me quickly share my screen. If you can just confirm you can see my screen, we will be on our way. Yep, you're all good. Okay, great. Okay, so um, uh, I've been meaning to give this talk for for a while now uh, because there is there is a tool I created uh, a long time ago, which I think it's uh, underappreciated and under uh, and uh, not used uh, widely enough for how powerful it is. So I wanted to talk about this to uh, to maybe build more awareness uh, of this and and give people a chance to to uh, to see uh, and and to see on on their own if it's if it's really useful and if this is something they would like to uh, use in their projects. Okay. <clears throat> so um, initial implementation was sponsored by the FreeBSD Foundation. I think it was part of my uh, work. Uh, with Capsicum. So uh, it started as, as, as just a part of, of different projects. Project. So <clears throat> it was inspired by Envilist API from OpenSolaris, but mostly <clears throat> on very basic level. So there is no uh, shared code. Uh, the APIs are different and uh, uh, it's pretty much totally different API. The name is the same, so it might be a bit confusing. It, it, and it actually uh, was a bit problematic when uh, my Envilist implementation was imported to the FreeBSD kernel. And all of a sudden, we have those uh, name conflicts with Envilist API brought uh, from OpenSolaris as a part of the ZFS port. But those are totally different, uh, totally different APIs. And uh, some concept was also inspired by SBUF API. I will talk about this um, later. So at Photo Security, we extended the API because we, we use it everywhere. Uh, I will show you some examples. Uh, uh, those extensions were not upstreamed yet, but uh, I would really like to do it so people can, uh, can really uh, start using it more and more. Okay, so so the, the basics. So uh, so uh, and the list API is simply uh, a way to manage name value pairs. So you can build a list of, of simply key and value uh, entries, and uh, and we uh, we want to support different types. We want to support nested envy lists because we want to express as many as much use cases as we can. Uh, and, and uh, make it useful in, in, in the most cases as we can. And uh, the, the key design goal uh, was to make it easy and fun to use. So it's, it's not like your regular C API. Uh, and uh, I hope you can appreciate that it's, uh, uh, that was the design goal because your common C APIs are just cumbersome and I, I wanted this to be just super easy to use. So uh, uh, so my claim is that whatever you do, it can be done better, faster and cleaner with, with uh, LibNV. Uh, and uh, and uh, I, I stand behind this claim and, uh, and you can prove me wrong, but uh, I see at uh, I see it uh, at my company that, uh, uh, the envy list is everywhere. And I also have to warn you, it's addictive. Once you start using this, you will want to use it everywhere. So we actually have problems, some problems in the code that we use envy list too much. So the code is uh, sometimes it's confusing uh, which envy list is which. Uh, so it's it just uh, super common in our code. Okay, so let's go. So. Let's let's try uh, to create some envy list and add some entries and, and go from there. So, uh, uh, as maybe you can see or not, but uh, I can even though I cannot see you, 
I can see disappointment in your eyes. So I was, uh, I was telling about this easy and fun to use API, but now we have like a regular C API where we just call those functions, check all the, uh, the failure cases. We have to deal with all the failures and, and basically the code is totally unreadable. So you're right. So this is not the, the end release API I'm talking about. So this is this is your like common C API. So this is how end release would look like if we didn't care about the ease of use and just follow the trends and just create a regular, a regular uh, C API. So this is how it actually looks like. So uh, we create uh, the the top level end list, we add some entries. As you can see, we don't check for any failures. Mm -hmm. So this is extremely important that uh, uh, it's uh, uh, when you when you develop in C and you and you see code like this, it's almost like magic or it's almost like it looks like a buggy code. Why don't you test actually for for errors here because the allocations can fail or something can go wrong. So, uh, but this is how the API was designed. It's not needed. You you, there, you, you cannot actually, you cannot check for uh, for errors. And the list add doesn't return anything. So, and, and it works. It will, internally, it will deal with all the failures. So you don't have to do that. Even if envy list create fails and event will, will be null, envy list add string and all the other functions can deal with that. They can simply uh, uh, ignore those failures and and uh, go forward. So we create the first the, the top level envy list. We add some entries. Then we create another envy list with with some entries uh, at this point numbers. And the last call in this block uh, moves the envy list as an entry to the uh, move the date envy list as an entry to the event envy list. So it will just be an element in the, in the event envy list. And the envy list move uh, basically gives up, uh, gives up ownership of the data. Uh, so uh, then we create uh, another envy list and we add this envy list again to, to event just as an entry to event here. Uh, you can see envy list add string f which allows you to use format string uh, to create an, a string you want to add to, to your envy list. So there's like uh, some useful uh, functions that uh, that are designed to make it really easy and and uh, and practical to use. So once the envy list uh, is is complete, we can convert this envy list to JSON, for example into a string and only here when there is any failure along the way the envy list to json will return null and then we can check erno uh, value for what actually happened so um, but uh, all the calls before that we didn't have to check for any errors and and we print the json so in result uh, we will get something like this so the JSON representation, the, the JSON uh, conversion was added uh, later. This is not upstream yet, I think. Uh, but it's, of course, JSON now is also very common. So uh, an envy list just fits right in. Uh, so this is how the, uh, the resulting JSON will look like. So we have a name and, and awesome entries uh, uh, in the top object. And we have two nested objects with some entries on their own. OK, how about reading the data? So again, your regular C API would uh, check for errors on every single call. So not with libnv, of course. So uh, I wanted this to be, for the data to be uh, immediately available. So you don't have, you don't have to use any uh, variables to to store the data first and check for errors. You just use uh, you just use uh, the envy list get calls directly. So you can just 
use them in, for print and um, there is no additional variables, there are no additional steps. The last line, you can see how you can uh, uh, fetch a value from, from nested and released. Maybe this is not super readable. So normally for this case, I would use uh, some variable to store the, the pointer to the, uh, to the talk and list first, but you can do this as well. Uh, so, so how to manage and list. So you create and list and uh, you have uh, two flags you can work with. Uh, ignore case, uh, it's pretty obvious. Uh, when we look up an entry, we ignore the, uh, the case in the name uh, you provided. So um, that can be sometimes useful. And another flag is allows us to, to add non-unique entries. Uh, normal, uh, like uh, when you don't use any flags, the entries name, the entry, na entry names have to be unique, which makes envilist get and, and other functions uh, uh, be unambiguous. But uh, sometimes, uh, and of course we want envilist to be uh, just generally useful. So sometimes you will deal with data that uh, uh, don't have unique names. And even in JSON, it's not, uh, uh, JSON standard doesn't tell you if, if the uh, the entries have to have unique names. Most parsers will ignore duplicates, but uh, 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 it doesn't uh, force you to not create, to, to have unique entries. So um, so it, it is possible with AnyBlist to, to deal with uh, such data as well. Uh, we can check error on at any given point. We can check if the AnyBlist failed at some point or not. We can check if the uh, envelope is empty. Uh, we have a function to clone entire envelope with all the nested envelopes. And uh, we can move entries from one envelope to another, and we can just dump the content of the envelope. This was pre-JSON. Those functions was uh, before the JSON integration. So they are still there. Uh, so what that data types are supported? So we support null, which basically is just entry with no data. Uh, uh, we support booleans, numbers, strings, uh, binary data. Uh, as I mentioned, envelists, we can add envelists, and we support different kinds of arrays for, uh, for all the data types. But what's also nice, and uh, might be a bit counterintuitive, but you can you can uh, you can store file descriptors uh, in envy lists, and this is especially useful for inter-process communication. Uh, but you you can do that. So how to add entries? So we have this those uh, functions that you can add entries. Uh, so uh, what those functions? Uh, those are just basic types. As you can see, you provide the values as const. So you don't, uh, you don't uh, transfer ownership uh, by adding those entries. So envelope will just allocate the data. And you can also uh, add arrays and you can add descriptors. So uh, again, you don't worry about any failures along the way. You just add, create your envelope and add entries. It will silently ignore all the, all the failures maybe not ignore, but accumulate all, or simply uh, handle all the failures for you. Uh, for envy list add, we will clone the data. So we'll allocate new, a new memory for the data. We'll copy the data over and, and create an entry pointing to, the, to this new data. Uh, when you add descriptor, we'll duplicate the descriptor and add to, to envy list. But again, there is no way to, to report a problem. So if the element already exists, we abort. So uh, there's a way to avoid that. Uh, uh, you can use different APIs if, if you expect the entry of the given name can exist, but simply uh, just don't add entries 
that are not unique. Of course, if you use uh, non, uh, no unique uh, flag, then, then you can do that. Another uh, family of functions are envelist move. Those functions are similar to add, uh, and you have a function almost for every type, except for like number. But uh, the problem here is that uh, the problem, those functions transfer ownership uh, to, to envelist. So if you have your string already allocated and you don't need your string, you can just envelist move the string and envelist will avoid memory allocations this way. So it will just use your data. So you simply pass the ownership of the data or file descriptors. Uh, if envelist move fails, uh, for example, it cannot allocate some, uh, some internal structures, then it will free your data. So you never deal with your data. You don't check the, er the, the errors and you don't, uh, it just fire and forget. So once you envelist move the data, you don't deal with the data any, any longer. And it doesn't matter if the envelist was in failed state or not. OK, we, we uh, move some data to envelist. Now, how to get this data back? Uh, so you have envelist get. And this is similar to envelist add in, in a way that you deal with const uh, const data. So um, uh, it will, uh, envelist get functions will give you the data, but the data still are managed by envelist. So this is just read only pointer to the, to the data you can use. Uh, but the entry stays on the envelist. So you just uh, uh, take a peek at, 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 the, at the given entry. Uh, but you have to be careful here because in here, uh, if envelist in failed state will abort because again, we cannot report error. So when you create envelist, you add your entries uh, and you are ready to, uh, to read the data, you have to use envelist error or some other function uh, to, uh, to make sure that envelist is actually in good shape. Because if it's not, it will, it will abort. Uh, if there is entry missing, we abort as well. So we don't do any tricks like uh, you try to get string and the string doesn't exist, so we will return a null. We don't do that because it will work with strings. It will work with, uh, let's say, binary data. But it won't work with numbers. Uh, it won't be unambiguous. Uh, and it won't work with like booleans, et cetera. So, uh, so simply uh, entries missing, we abort. So to avoid uh, crash, you, you, you can use envelist exist functions or we have additional API, the envelist get that you could you can use uh, to avoid, avoid those failures. So one, one, uh, one missing bit in, in uh, uh, envy lists, and this is something that prevented me to advertise envy lists uh, uh, louder uh, was uh, slow lookups uh, because the envy list that is, uh, for example, uh, currently in FreeBSD uh, is just double linked list. So if we have to find an entry on this list, we have to just traverse the entire the entire list, and uh, this works well for small data sets. But if you have very large data set, this, of course, is not optimal. So uh, we we have uh, uh, we added uh, uh, lookups over red black trees. Uh, and, uh, and now the lookups are not a problem anymore. So we can always quickly find an entry on the list. So that was one missing bit, uh, I think, for just uh, like uh, to make it really generally useful for any size of data sets. OK, uh, so we have envelist add and envelist get to operate on. Uh, uh, and we have envelist move and envelist take. So what envelist take does is removes the entry from envelist and, and give us the data back. So we regain the ownership of the data. 
So uh, again, it's useful to avoid any additional memory allocation if you want to take the data. And, but once we and we least take the data, we are responsible for freeing it. So, um, so it just, uh, yeah, uh, this is the main difference between at least get and take. But this data, you can do whatever you want because now you are the owner of the data. Uh, so removes the entry from NVList, regains ownership of the data. But again, if NVList in failed state, entry is missing, we abort. So use NVList error um, before uh, trying to uh, trying to take any data from from the NVList or uh, uh, and uh, to avoid uh, aborts on missing entry. NVList exists is your friend or the NVList take uh, API. Uh, okay, so you have some functions, familiar functions to, to check if the <clears throat> if the entry exists. So NVList exist and type the, the 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 top line will check if the entry of the given name and given type exists. Uh, the second function NVList exist will just check if the entry of the given name exists, no matter the type. Um, and uh, we also have NVList exist type where we can provide type as, as, as basically defined. Uh, uh, and then believe type known is special in the sense that we just ignore the type. So internally, nvlist exist is using nvlist exist type with nv type none. Okay, how to uh, move nvlists around? So uh, you have nvlist pack and unpack to turn nvlist into binary blob that you can easily send over. And you can unpack this binary blob on the other side using kind of list unpack. Uh, you can, of course, always use JSON, to convert and list to JSON and back. But if you want to, uh, if you want to take advantage of uh, being able to transfer file descriptors, you have to use and list send and receive, or and list. Uh, so and list send and receive, they will deal with file descriptors internally. So uh, of course it will all only work. Uh, it will only work on uh, mm, uh, Unix domain sockets. So, but if you need like inter-process communication, you have to move file descriptors around. Uh, like especially when you use uh, Capsicum sandboxing or something like this, you have to use NVLIST send in order uh, to to send file descriptors along with the with the data. Uh, there is also a wrapper nvlist expert on send and receive. So it will send your nvlist, free the nvlist for you, uh, destroy the nvlist for you, and receive the nvlist uh, in return and return the nvlist uh, uh, that was received to you. So it just uh, to simplify code a bit. So uh, Edvilist is not fully compatible with JSON. There are uh, there are some <clears throat> some things we cannot uh, uh, we cannot really convert to C. Uh, and uh, so, uh, for example, of course, file descriptors we cannot put any file descriptors on on Edvilist and uh, on JSON. And JSON also doesn't support the binary data. So uh, those Edvilist cannot be converted to JSON. Uh, JSON supports empty uh, empty arrays, which uh, Envilist also supports. But in JSON, uh, based on the mm, uh, just by parsing JSON, we can tell what type what type the value has. Uh, it's easy to tell, except for empty arrays. If an array is empty, we cannot tell. Uh, what type of uh, data we we uh, it should be there, so we can uh, so design decision was to only support converting nvlist arrays, uh, empty nvlist arrays to JSON and back. So if we see an empty array in JSON, we'll convert it to an empty nvlist array 
and if we have empty list, uh, envy list array in, in envy list, we'll convert this to JSON. But any other type will result in an error. Uh, I'm on the fence with this, so uh, it might be useful sometimes to be able to convert envy list even one way. So when we have empty list of strings, this we could convert to JSON. We just couldn't convert it back. But uh, for now, uh, we will just return an error. Um, so JSON also supports a way to uh, to build an array of elements of different types. So you can have a single array with an object, number, string, boolean, etc., which will be really hard to express in C. So or impossible. So this is this is also not supported. Uh, so other stuff, uh, we can uh, get type of the given uh, of the given entry. We can free the entries. Uh, we can replace the entries. So uh, if you are not sure if the entry is already there, we can replace uh, the entry with the new value. It doesn't have to uh, be the value of the same type. We will replace an entry. Uh, it can be different types, and we can replace that as well. And we can we have some functions that let just uh, uh, can help us operate on arrays. So instead of just fetching the array and iterating over the all the entries in array, we can simply use let's say envy list exist number array element to tell us if the given value uh, is on this array without going through all the additional steps. Um, and we have those alternatives API, alternative APIs that are really handy. So the envy list uh, works similar to envy list get and envy list take, but it can deal with missing entries. So instead of, uh, so if the entry is missing, it will just return the default value you can see as a, uh, given as, a, as the last argument. So instead of checking if the uh, entry exists and uh, getting the entry, you can simply just use the env list get and provide the default value. It doesn't have to be null. It can be any string uh, or any value for different types, but uh, it just allows you to, to simplify the code. Another alternative API uh, contributed by Adam Starak is uh, cnv list. <clears throat> Uh, internally, envy lists operate on uh, each entry is represented internally uh, by this envy pair structure. Uh, this structure is not exposed publicly, uh, but uh, so this cookie here represents actually a pointer to this internal structure. Uh, and this is handy when, when you traverse over envy lists. Uh, I will show you uh, an example in a minute. So envy list next function is used to, to traverse over envy list. So we can just go over each entry one at a time. Uh, this is very, uh, very common case for us. We can also use envy list get cookie to, to get a cookie. So for example, if we have to return um, up just a pointer to, to an entry somewhere else, we don't want to have different functions for different type. Uh, from different types, we can just return a cookie, so we can get the cookie based on the entry name, and then later we can use C and release type to to check the type of the cookie and extract the value. So this is example how to traverse and list. Uh, so we simply set cookie to null, and so and release next knows that we we are about to start, and then each interact itera uh, iteration. It will return the name of the uh, of the entry of the next entry, its type, and will uh, override the cookie. The type is optional; it can be null. If you don't need type, you don't have to provide the variable for that. But then you can just check the type and and fetch the value using CNV list uh, API, CNV list get API, based on the on the cookie. So CNV list get simply goes the, straight to the to the envy pair. You don't have to. Uh, it doesn't have to do any lookups. It just has a pointer to envy pair and just returns the value. 
Okay, so where do we use it? Well, pretty much everywhere. So uh, I did some calculations. So it, it looks like around 5% of our C code, maybe a bit less, but those were end list calls. So we have uh, a library that, that allows us to talk to Postgres using envy list. So when we insert an entry, when we update an entry, we just, we just send envy lists to this, uh, to this interface. And when we need to get some data back from Postgres through select or something similar, we will just get envy lists back with all the columns and all the values. So we have entire like HTTP library implemented on top of NV lists, uh, REST API daemon implemented in C, so we can have uh, sandboxing with Capsicum, and all the parsing is done within those uh, libraries. So uh, the consumer only deals with NV lists. So I will show you an example of such an NV list in a moment. So in the process communication, again, we use Capsicum heavily. We, we pretty much sandbox everything we can. So in order to communicate between sandbox process and privileged process, we just use NV lists, uh, which also allows us to, to send file descriptors. Our logging library is, is also based on NV lists. So each event that we log, it can be, uh, we can attach uh, uh, to this event, we can attach object objects that were uh, involved in the given event. And NVLIS just makes this super easy. We also have even Python bindings for NVLIS developed by Tomek uh, at Fudo. Uh, so, uh, but it's in our code, it's, it's, it's everywhere. So this is the example I was talking about. So when we receive HTTP uh, request, this is what we get. Uh, this is uh, what we get. This is represented by JSON, but this this is the list we get from from this uh, from this uh, HTTP library. So we we see the request. We have the method. We have all the uh, URL parameters nicely uh, uh, split into into different uh, elements. Uh, we have uh, all the headers. If there are cookies, then there will be nested NV list with all the cookies in there. And we have the data in case of post. We will see the data uh, as uh, data was actually sent as a JSON, but again, it's converted to NV list. So we can easily access the data. And so pretty much uh, uh, it's. In, in this format, all the data is like super easy to access. So it makes everything so much simpler. So potential freebies the use case. So I'm sure there are like a million others, but just some examples. So imagine you have the entire sysctl tree represented as nested envy list. So all the tree is just envy lists, which would be uh, would, which would provide much, much cleaner API uh, for, for CCTLs. Not sure if all the types can be represented at this point, but, but it's, uh, and these are really flexible. So, uh, so I could imagine this could be done. So you can also think about NVLIS as an IOCTL alternative. Instead of using cumbersome IOCTLs, uh, you can just send and receive NVLISs. We also have some similar APIs and that were operating like on name value parse, for example, nmount or libgeom uses uh, gctl functions to also uh, pack requests uh, and send them over to the kernel. Uh, uh, Knf and uh, again, as I said before, I'm pretty sure whatever you use you could benefit probably from just using envy lists and, and make it code, code simpler. Uh, okay, I think that's it. I think uh, I'm good on time. So um, uh, are there any questions? Okay. I can see QA, Q and A box. Yeah, so I can read them to you if you'd like. 
Uh, yes, sure. Go ahead. Um, it will be. First question we have is, are envy list send and receive functions over Unix sockets compatible with non-blocking KQ event loops in user space? I think they're trying to, under, to, to say, can you use, if you have a daemon using KQ with a bunch of non-blocking sockets, can you use envy list send and receive like as a handler for one of your events going off? Uh, yes, I, I think we use them like this. So it, it, it should be possible, no problem. Okay. It says, can envy list be used with a custom memory allocator? Uh, with uh, custom memory allocators? Uh, currently, uh, no. All the allocators are allocations are just done uh, internally. It would be useful, especially uh, like in the kernel, I saw a change where somebody changed allocation from wait okay to no wait. Uh, so, um, which I don't think it's, it's useful because we can, uh, even if there is some memory available in the kernel, we can still some, sometimes use uh, uh, failed allocations if we just use no wait flag. So, uh, it would be useful to, to be able to. Uh, to use uh, other allocators and other ways to like allocate memory internally, but currently that's not support. Okay. The next question we have is how are um, file descriptor passing failures handled? For example, if you run into resource limits when you're trying to instantiate the file descriptor on the, on the road end. So simply uh, the, the send operation will fail. So once the operation, that once the send fails, you uh, you have to destroy envy list and it will destroy all the descriptors along with it. So uh, it's simply just send or and receive failure. Okay. <clears throat> um, the next one is, uh, does envy list have integration into libxo? I guess this is because both of them kind of can do JSON-ish. Uh, yes. Uh, no, not that I know of, um, and I don't know uh, libxo uh, that well, but I, I, I'm aware of its existence. So uh, uh, it, it definitely might be useful. I can also imagine like adding other ways to represent data, uh, like that we can now have envilist uh, to JSON. We could easily have envilist to like YAML or envilist to XML and stuff like that. So. Uh, but uh, I don't know about any existing uh, integration. Okay. And then I think we have a follow-up to the question about K-Event, which is asking um, if you're doing an envy list send, for example, on a non-blocking socket, or, then how do you deal with like a, if you get back E again, like a, or like you've done a partial write, how, like, how would, I think that's what they're imagining is how would you cope with the fact that if you have a large envy list that would be bigger than what you could write in one go, kind of how would that work? Uh, okay, so uh, you could de definitely deal with those cases where you just you, just pack envy list uh, with using envy list pack and just use your own ways to send and receive, because uh, this is actually interesting because it, it's different on FreeBSD and Linux. So, and I'm not sure. Either implementation is uh, like fully unambiguous, but uh, on FreeBSD you can use data along with uh, a bunch of file descriptors with in one go. Right. But you you cannot really tell what succeeded and what didn't. So you can uh, I think it's possible to end up in like receiving part of the data and part of the file descriptors and or something like this. On Linux you can only send one file descriptor. So I'm not sure if that was the uh, the, not sure why exactly, but maybe it was uh, related to this. Uh, but uh, you can always use envilist pack and unpack and, and just send uh, the data on your own. And I guess the risk though is I don't think envilist pack doesn't really have a way to represent a file descriptor yeah. in a way that would make a control message when you call send message. It doesn't, correct, yeah. Uh, I would need to, I guess, check to, to, to see what exactly will happen, but uh, uh, because I'm, I'm not sure if we do use, uh, uh, 
I'm pretty sure we do use and release. We can send and release with non-blocking sockets uh, for uh, when we communicate over the network. So there are no file descriptors in this case. Uh, and I'm not sure how how we deal if we do have examples of using and release sent over Unix domain socket on non-blocking sockets. So I'm not I'm not hundred percent sure to be honest. Okay. That's, I'll, I think it's all the questions we had over in the Zoom. I'll check and see if we have any other follow-ups on IRC. Sure. I uh, didn't see any questions on IRC. Um, so I think we're probably good. Thank you very much for your talk, Pavel. Yes, thank you very much, guys. Uh, it was it was a shame not to meet you in person, but maybe next time. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm quite hopeful that next time we do this will be in person. So great. Okay, thank you very much. Bye. Okay, thanks, Paul. <clears throat> okay, so that uh, let's see, let me fix this here. Oh, good. So that uh, wraps up our uh, track for today for the first half of our Fugitive Vendor Summit. We'll be back again tomorrow at the same time. So we'll look forward to seeing you there. Uh, and you're welcome to hang out on the hallway track even after the main track is over. So thank you for coming today and we'll see you all tomorrow.